You know, the reason we reflect on his message, his legacy, and his work on the weekend that bears his name is because, again, when we sing those words, kingdom come, right, heaven come, heaven be here, that's not a passive cry like, God, come fix this. There's, there's work that he wants us to do. And that's, again, that's the work of justice and peace and unity. And I think of Martin Luther King's letter has become known as pilgrimage to nonviolence. But he wrote, the gospel at its best deals with the whole man, not only his soul, but his body, not only his spiritual well-being, but his material well-being. Any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually moribund religion awaiting burial. Those are heavy words, and that's a more uh, less prominent writing, but this time of year, I always encourage anyone who will listen, like this weekend, just read a letter from a Birmingham jail. It takes like 15 minutes. It's like 12 pages long in the book I've got, maybe a little more than a dozen pages. And what's wild to me every time I, I read it is just how it came to be, right? It was a response to an a, a, a article in a newspaper called A Call to Unity by eight white pastors from Alabama. It was a call to unity because uh, it was addressing Martin Luther King Jr.'s, his, his nonviolent protests and the trouble that it was causing. These people were more concerned with peacekeeping than peacemaking and status quo over kingdom come. So Martin Luther King, he, he started writing his response. What was wild to me is the letter from Birmingham jail is incredible writing. He started writing it on the margins of that same newspaper that this article was in. And then he continued writing it on scraps of paper that inmates hustled to him. And then he finished it finally on the legal pad of his attorney. And again, we get these 12 plus pages that, that read incredibly. For instance, one pastor says, in deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather unique position of being the son, the grandson, and the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect, through fear of being nonconformists. He says, there was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Right, all this stuff on like the margins of a newspaper from a cell. And I read that for good reason, not just to note the quality, but he points to the early church. And tonight I want to look at the early church because Pastor Fred last week started this series, Me and Mine, by looking at the letter of Revelation. And he looked at Revelation 17, and the whole book of Revelation was written by John, addressed to the seven churches and the early church in the Roman Empire. And tonight I want to read from it's Romans 18. The, verse, the verses following the passage, Fred introduced this with last week, but a continuation of some of the imagery. It says in Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5, it says, Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for scripture. And we thank you that as we looked at earlier and considered earlier, as it says in the book of Romans, God, it transforms our mind. God, it renews our vision. And God, I pray tonight, Holy Spirit, that you would use it to do just that. So we can walk out of here with a, a heavenly perspective saying, here comes heaven because you're going with us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. So again, we're in the second week of this series, Me and Mine, and if the theme last week was catch up in Pastor Fred's sermon, the theme this week is come out, come out. You know, just as I encourage the church this time of year to, to read the letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, I also, man, every January, everybody who will listen, I encourage them, man, begin to read the Bible from cover to cover. If you never have, begin to read the Bible from cover to cover. Because I truly believe that the reason we can be so easily misled or derailed as individuals, as a church, even sometimes as a nation, is because so many of us in the church, we read Bible verses, but we don't read our Bible. What I mean is we're, we're often a culture of copy and paste Christians where there's a verse over here, there's a, a quote from a sermon over here, maybe there's something that was shared on Facebook over here, and we begin to, to put together our biblical worldview, but you know who else copies and pastes? The enemy. Right? He tempted Adam and Eve with God's own words in the garden, just slightly distorting them, right? and he derailed all of humanity. He tempts Jesus in the wilderness with verses, the very word of God, but in a way that contradicted the will of God. 
And I don't share this because we need to be wary of Scripture, but so that we can be aware that Scripture interprets Scripture. And, and, and the same way that the truth will set us free, half-truths can, they can hurt us. So, so reading Scripture from cover to cover, being aware of the greater content and context of Scripture, it's so freeing. So let us, in, in this year, let us be people that begin that journey if we haven't. Because there's a sad statistic. 30% of American Christians, people who call themselves believers, will never read the Bible from cover to cover. So in 2021, if that's not you, let's be a part of that 30%. And let me also encourage you, there is nothing extra sanctified about starting reading your Bible cover to cover like in the first week of January. So <laughs> there's nothing less sanctified if you start it on Monday, Tuesday, or even Wednesday. There's also nothing more anointed about finishing it in one year. It might take you a year and a half. It might take you two, three, whatever. Just start the journey. Let's root ourselves in God's word because it renews our mind. And it's only through that that we're going to go out there and renew the world. But if you start reading it from the beginning, as many do in January, what I love about reading the beginning of Genesis is we get like God's first impressions, his first encounters with humanity and mankind. Like consider the very first words of God to Abraham in Genesis 12, verses one through three. First words, first three words, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. All the peoples on earth will be blessed by you. So I like to put myself in Abraham's shoes and think, man, think about how this conversation went as he's leaving. So why are you leaving, Abraham? A voice told me to, God told me to. So where are you going? I don't know, right? I don't know. You think I'm making this up? In Hebrews 11:8, 8, it says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He didn't even know where he was going. That is some faith. You know, to me, it calls to mind a Martin Luther King quote that says, faith is taking the first step when you don't even see the whole staircase. See, God's invitation, his first impression with Abraham boils down to Abraham taking this massive first step of faith. Leave everything you know and follow me. Talk about challenging the perspective of me and mine, right? Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Everything that you consider me and mine, my family, my land, my comfort, my security, leave it and follow God. And it's notable that when he finally made a clean break from his father's family and leaves Lot behind, and some would debate that he should have done that from the jump, when he finally leaves Lot and separates from Lot, God appears to Abraham and says, from where you are, look to the north and the south and the east and the west. All the land you see, I will give you. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land for I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it, right? You see, God, he might ask us to give up a lot, but this passage reminds us that we can never outgive God. Right? If Abraham had clung to everything he knew and everything that comprised his me and mine, when God invited him to leave it in the long run, he would have lived a small life. But instead, he lived open-handed and opened himself up to God's will. You see, when we cling to me and mine, anytime we cling to me and mine, we end up living smaller than God's will. You know, in a passage that echoes God's word to Abraham, where Paul is writing the church in Corinth, and in 2 Corinthians 6, this is the message version. He says, dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. Again, anytime we cling to me and mine, we end up living smaller than God's will. But when we open up our hands to embrace God's call on our lives, we live openly and expansively. When we read Abraham's invitation from God in Genesis 12, sometimes it reads crazy. Again, leave everything you know. But then when you again, look at the greater context of scripture, God's consistent in this invitation. Jesus, again, Pastor Fred hit on this last week, his invitation to people that wanted to follow him was deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. But that's all I know, deny yourself. But that's what makes me happy, deny yourself. But that's, that's where I feel secure, deny yourself. Not so that you can live less and restricted and boxed in, but so you can live openly and expansively in all God has for you. It's always better. You can't outgive God. 
See, everyone wants the measure of blessing that Abraham had. But few of us really and truly live as open-handedly as he did. He was willing to give up everything to follow God. At one point, willing to give up his son to obey God. And I think part of the reason is it's so hard for us in our culture is we've got this cup of me and mine that Pastor Fred preached on last week. The American dream is beautiful, y'all, right? That, that the essence of our freedom is we can come from any background and work hard and establish ourselves, establish something for our name and our family. This hope and this ability to, to come from nothing and establish yourself is a beautiful thing. Let me be clear. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, God says to Abraham, hey, I'm going to establish you. I'm going to make your name great to the point you're a nation. And he goes on to bless him with great wealth. But Abraham's security and his identity and what we see again and again is it was rooted in God. And his hope and his faith was in God's promises. But see, when we become tied to the American dream and tethered to the American dream, sometimes our security can become tethered to our bank account. Or when we cling to the American dream, sometimes our identity can be tied to our, our, our career or our assets. And when this is the case, we too easily step into what Mark Batterson calls irresponsible responsibility, where we turn responsibilities into excuses that keep us from pursuing God fully. Irresponsible responsibility. Can I make that up? That's Mark Batterson. But last weekend, Pastor Fred spoke on following God. And how often when you look at the 12 pathways and all of our spiritual disciplines, so often it's, it's giving that we got to look back at and say, hey, catch up. And one of those reasons I believe we hold back is it's so easy to, to hold back giving under the guise of responsibility. I'm just trying to be responsible for my family with my finances. But if we do so in a way that is disobedient to God, then it's irresponsible responsibility. It's turning responsibilities into excuses that keep us from following God fully. And you know, in our flesh, in our culture's perspective, the responsible thing for Abraham to do when he hears a voice say, hey, leave everything and I ain't going to tell you where you're going, probably would have been to bunker down. At least wait for some directions, right? Print out some map quest if you're old school, whatever, so you at least know where you're going. That would have been the responsible thing. But anytime we cling to me and mine, we end up living small. When we open up our hands to embrace God's call, we'll live openly and expansively. Again, we read earlier, God says to Abram at the outset of chapter 12, I will make your name great. And if you're reading cover to cover in your Bible, you know that that's an echo and a juxtaposition of the passage that comes immediately before that, the Tower of Babel. We're here in chapter 11, there's a people's attempt to build a tower at Babel that would reach to the heavens. And at the outset, they say, let's make a name for ourselves. But instead, God squashes their efforts, he complicates their language, and in doing so, he forces them to separate and spread out. Now, what sin God took issue with and why he did this to their project, it's a fun theological rabbit hole to go down, right? Some would say it's pride. Some would say it's because they weren't obeying the command to, to go out and fill the earth, and each has its supporters and detractors, but one line of thinking is that the problem is with the structure itself. Because it, what it would have likely been in that culture at that time was a ziggurat. Now, ziggurats were stepped pyramid structures that were common in that time. They were believed to be a, a stairway to heaven. Maybe that's where Led Zeppelin got their song, because that's their idea. It's a stairway to heaven that connects heaven to where it was built. And it's evidenced by many of their names. One of them is literally named Stairway to Heaven. And this was problematic. Why? because it, it, it tied the gods, limited the gods to that people in their nation. Sound familiar? Based on sacrifices, the gods were obligated to that people and, and their nation, not people to God. God existed to, to serve that people based on what they did for him rather than the other way around. God wasn't about that then. He's not about that now. God is and was transcendent. Right? And just as Pastor Fred hit on the seven mountains last week and how the, the mountain of Jerusalem is supposed to be above all of them. You can't limit that to, to government. You can't limit that to nation. The same way God transcends any tower, any ziggurat that would try to tie him to one nation or one people. But in spite of God dispersing them here in Genesis, the desire to build and utilize this land came back later. The land around this region would later become home to Babylon. The empire of Babylon became so prolific and significant in history that Babylon became synonymous with empire. 
That's why the word Babylon happens in Scripture and is referenced in Scripture some 290 times in the Bible. And it's named in the sin-filled vision of evil we read from last week in Revelation 17. And the key to Babylonian worship were these ziggurats. One historian said, and I quote, they were the most powerful representation of the Babylonian religious system. So it's notable that in spite of the similar building project to the original Tower of Babel, no structure or pile of bricks would ever reach heaven in this land, but the sins of empire would. Revelation 18 that we open with say that the sins of empire pile up to heaven. Is this saying, and am I saying that urbanization or nations are bad? Not at all, right? I love America, our democracy, our freedoms. Thankful every day for the people that defend our freedoms. And in those freedoms, we daily get to choose to do, to be. And God wanted the nation that would come from Abraham to choose to be a blessing. To who? All people. But you know the posture and pull of empire that I want to look at tonight, this posture of proverbial Babylon is drinking from the cup in Revelation 17. It's that cup of me and mine. No matter the cost on others. It's how we see sins like exploitation and even slavery come to fruition in nations throughout history, even our own. It's what made Martin Luther King's work and the entire civil rights movement so necessary because in our nation there was a posture of me and mine that was only relegated to one race. But if you took Pastor Fred up on his offer, his challenge last weekend to read from Revelation 17 to the end of the Bible, the end of Revelation, you might ask, why is there all this dense, sometimes confusing, shrouded, and sometimes wild imagery like we see in Revelation 17 and 18? One reason I believe is because John, he's writing a subversive, bold, courageous letter to, again, these seven churches he addresses and everyone else that would read it under the Roman Empire. He's telling them to come out from the sin of the Roman Empire, divorce themselves from the Roman Empire, all while he's imprisoned by the Romans on this island of Patmos. So for him to get this letter out, it no doubt had to pass through Roman hands. So I don't think that's, or I do think that's one reason we see it so steeped in imagery, sometimes to the point where it seems confusing. Now don't get me wrong tonight. Does the book of Revelation have prophetic significance for today as well as our future? Absolutely. But we can't miss the direct meaning of the letter to those churches John was writing to in the midst of this Roman Empire. And lucky for us, we have accounts and quotes from early Christians who were living out this collision, really, between the establishment of the church and the Roman Empire, between the kingdom of God and man's empire. For instance, in the early church, my name's not in the Bible, some sad trivia, but there was a man in the early church named Justin the Martyr. Justin the Martyr, he wrote, that God called Abraham and commanded him to go out from the country where he was living. With this, God, with this call, God has roused us all, and we now have left the state. We have renounced all things the world offers. This may sound radical, but it flows in obedience to Revelation 18.4, where right out of the vision Pastor Fred preached from last week, it transitions again to this voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. Come out of that culture, that way of life, that worldview. This didn't speak to a, a physical uprooting geographically like it did for Abraham, but it did speak to uprooting from Roman worship and culture and paganism. You know, just like when Paul talks to the church about being set apart, or when Jesus prays in John 17 about that like, he desires his people to be set apart, it's not a physical separation. Paul said, hey, if you want that, you got to leave the earth, right? We're not going to be physically set apart. This isn't about geographic position as much as it's about our heart's condition. Set apart is speaking to holiness. To come out speaks to holiness. Because see, Rome established its rule with this expectation that subjects would worship Rome. They'd worship Caesar. I think sometimes we forget that the early church, they weren't killed and martyred and fed to lions, and they didn't suffer these horrible deaths just because they worshiped Jesus. They suffered these deaths because they worshiped Jesus alone and they wouldn't worship Caesar or any other idol. They were set apart. Another member of the early church, Athenagoras, explained it this way. They charge us on two points, that we do not sacrifice and that we do not believe in the same gods as the state. And it's from this twofold charge that Christians got one of their first names. You know, if you were a part of the early church, you would have been called an atheist. The early church was called this 
because they refused to believe in the idols of the Roman Empire. They refused to put their faith and hope in Rome and worship Caesar. This is what Justin the Martyr was talking about when he said, we have left the state. Obedience to this voice from heaven that said, come out of her, my people, so you will not share her sins. This is a whole nother sermon for another time, but you could preach a whole sermon from this on the nature of systemic sin. Sin is communal, right? Attached to a body of people or a nation where individual culpability may vary wildly. The idea that those who profit from and are complicit in the sins of a nation sharing the judgment, that's a deep dive, but if you want to go on that this week, Ezra 9 and Daniel 9 are two chapters you should read. But I want to look at the nature of this specific sin, which is also systemic because it has to do with the economy of empire. You know, perhaps it shouldn't be shocking as we transition out of the picture of the prostitute in Revelation 17 that this come out of her in chapter 18 in the Greek, it's sexual in nature. And I'll leave it at that for the sake of our kids. But this treatment of economic empires, is not limited to Revelation or Babylon or Rome. Both Ezekiel and Isaiah prophesy against Tyre, which was this, this massive city, this massive nation that merchants would have to go through in the Old Testament. And they too compared Tyre to a prostitute. And what's implied is that there exists this lustful pull in our flesh towards the things and the posture of empire. This pull to drink from the cup of me and mine. And to marry yourself to it and to drink from it is adultery against God, our first love. You know, one crowd that loved the woman in Revelation 17 and is tied to her in chapter 18, it happens in verse 11, it's merchants. Merchants who had sold their product and their wares in the market. And specifically in Rome, there was the Agora, which was the market of that day. See, the Roman Empire understood that economics was key to controlling such a vast empire. Rome was everywhere, right? And the way they, they attempt to control it was through the economy. You want to control the people? They were like, okay, let's control their money. To use the Roman market, you had to present a sacrifice to Caesar on the way in. And to identify the people that had made this sacrifice, they put a system in place where you were marked either on your hand or your head, and then you could go and, and buy and sell and take place in this economy. See, the mark that would allow you to buy and sell in the market, you got if you worshiped another God, if you worshiped Caesar. Fun fact, if, you know, Hebrew letters have numeric qualities, and if you add up all the letters in the name Nero Caesar, this brutal uh, ruler from Rome, the number is right there in John's layered poetic letter, 666, this mark of the beast. And see, you were reminded of the mark you received and the offering you made to Caesar every time your hand would exchange coins, buy and sell. And you see, I share this tonight because as hard as we try to divorce our faith and our finances, they have an inseparable relationship. See, the Romans understood this in the way they attempted to tie their very economy to the worship of Rome. And the enemy, Satan, he understands that money presents a fast track to our hearts and our worship. Jesus understood this. <laughs> it's why he spoke on money more, almost more than anything else, right? Matthew says he only spoke in parables. 16 out of the 38 we have recorded in the Gospels deal with money. But what does all this mean for us, right? The way I shop and go about my business is way different than Rome. The only place where I have to flash something to get in and buy and sell is Sam's Club, right? And I don't see anything wrong with that, right? So what does this have to do with us in America? Well, the theologian and author William Durness once wrote a book about American culture and the American church. And he said, in many respects, American identity is established in material terms. We define ourselves by our relation to our material environment, perhaps more than our relation to other people, or even to God, that this has resulted in great material prosperity and great technological accomplishment, we can readily acknowledge, right? That's a good thing, but we know the dark side as well. Americans invariably tend to endow material means with ultimate or final value. Owning a home, for example, is seen as one of the ends of life rather than a means to other ends. Meaning is attached to accumulation and consuming. See, American culture and freedom has created this context for prosperity and advancement that he remarks upon here, and we should celebrate, right? That our culture, there's this, this, this ability and freedom to advance and accomplish things. But the dark side he speaks to is this pull to finding our value in accumulation and consuming. See, I would tell you tonight that the accumulation of assets 
without a gospel complex, or excuse me, a gospel context will create a God complex. An accumulation of assets without gospel context will create a God complex again and again. Without a posture of giving like Christ gave, his very life, accumulation quickly becomes about me and mine. Rather than the posture of the nation that would come from Abraham to bless all people, we adopt the posture of empire. And so often we begin to build our own empire on the foundation of me and mine, and whether we admit it or not, we're on the throne. That's why the author Randy Alcorn once said so fittingly, giving affirms Christ's lordship. It dethrones me and exalts him. See, God makes giving a part of our worship, not because God wants roughly 10% of your heart. No, God wants all. Right? He wants total surrender. The, the hymn is not called, I surrender 10%. The hymn is called, I surrender all, right? It's not the percentage that pleases the Lord, it's the posture. It's not the percentage that pleases God, but the generous, open-handed posture of the heart that gives it. You know, I find it wildly interesting that when Paul is writing 2 Corinthians, he's writing to the church in Corinth about this offering. They said they were going to give, and they're dragging their feet on it, and he's trying to encourage them to give it. And he uses six different words in the Greek to refer to this offering. He uses words that mean collection, priestly service, ministry, blessing, partnership, and grace. None of those words explicitly even speak to money. And I believe it's because Paul wasn't as concerned with the amount as he was with the posture of their hearts. He knew that money is, is like this access to our heart and he, he wanted to know that their posture was correct. But you know what the posture today is in America is so often me and mine, clinging rather than open-handed. It was a half century ago that a study was done that found American Christians gave less than 2.5% of their income. Maybe think, well, hopefully it got better, right? It was a half century ago. Now we're not growing, we're shrinking. Just three years ago, a study showed that one in four American church going Christians don't give a dime annually, like to anything, anything at all. Generosity, not a dime. One in four in the church, getting, not giving, consuming, not contributing. Discipled by a culture of me and mine. You see, this posture of empire that's infiltrated our hearts is let me store up treasure for me and mine. But Jesus tells his followers to store our treasures in heaven. That doesn't mean you get on your cash app and you're like, how do I transfer my money to heaven? Or there's no like the fiery chariot, they got Elijah. There's no fiery Brinks truck that's gonna come down and, and take your assets up to heaven. No, Jesus is talking about seeking a new treasure altogether. See, giving is an exercise in recognizing that material things, they can't compare to eternal things. Does that mean that money or assets or having treasure is bad? No, otherwise God wouldn't have blessed Abraham with so much that he became a nation or Solomon or Job. But why was Abraham blessed? For his nation alone? No, so all the peoples on earth would be blessed through him and his people. See, blessing others, that takes a willingness to live open-handed with a loose grip on your blessings. And what was Abraham blessed for? So you will be a blessing to others. Again, money isn't evil. Right? Money is not the root of all evil. It's the most misquoted scripture. The love of money is. And you want to shake free of the love of money? Begin to love with your money. Live generously. Don't love your money. Love with your money. You'll begin to change your heart and renew your mind when you live generously with open hands reaching out. But what did this open-handed kingdom posture look like walked out practically in the Roman Empire? You know, until recently, I always considered when Jesus said, hey, there will always be poor among you. I thought this was a reminder that like in our fallen world, until he comes back, there's always gonna be poor people and we should be mindful to, to help them, people in the margins, to reach out to them. But it wasn't until recently that I considered in, in Acts, immediately after Pentecost, the early church was living so open-handed and generously that they'd solved poverty amidst themselves. It says in Acts 2 that there was no needy persons among them. And see, you might think, well, their perspective was probably me and mine, so they could do that. No, it wasn't that. And it wasn't even just us and ours. And I know this because we have other history recorded. The Emperor Julian was a Roman emperor not long after Christ walked the soil of the Roman Empire. And Christianity at the time was, was booming and paganism was declining. And he laments and events, and it's on record. And he says, the religion of the Greeks does not prosper. Why do we not observe how the charity of Christians to strangers has done the most to advance their cause? 
It is disgraceful that these Christians support our poor in addition to their own, while everyone is able to see our own lack aid from us. See, the Roman culture, it was operating from this, the posture of us and them and us versus them, right? Sound familiar? Tribalism, racism, these aren't new issues. Greeks were taking care of Greeks. Romans were taking care of Romans. Meanwhile, Christians were showing the love of Christ and generosity, even to strangers and what culture would have called enemies. Our poor, in addition to their own. It was a far cry from the way most live concerned with me and mine. Me, my family, my tribe. You see, the Bible doesn't leave room for us to withdraw further into our politicized corners, nor does it leave room for us to place our faith or our hope in a nation. Biblically speaking, we're called to come out, live holy lives with a posture that is open-handed and reaching out. What was causing the growth in the early church that we always aspire to, we always want that that booming growth that we see in the early church, living generously and open-handed. What was grabbing the attention of of Roman emperors, living generously and open-handed. May we live in the same way, open-handed, reaching out and living generously. If I could have the worship team come up, though, I'm going to brag on my son for a minute. Y'all can wait because I'm going to brag on Raj. Y'all know to to know Raj is to love him. (laughs) God bless David's daughter, Selah, recently said, yeah, Raj is my best friend. Sometimes he gets so excited when he sees me that he hits me. (laughs) Jack, Jack Lee once said, yeah, Raj is my best friend. Sometimes he hits me. See, we adopted Raj. Man, four years ago in February. And that was like a, yeah, you know, that's crazy. Time flies. It was a four and a half year process for us to get there. And then when we got there, it was like over in a blink. We show up on Tuesday and we're in the orphanage and we meet Raj and we're there for about two hours. Just long enough to see how he gets fed, right? The, the dynamic of the playroom where you, you quickly realize this is, this is uh, all about me and mine. It was a no-holds-barred battle royale for anything you wanted. If Raj wanted a toy, he had to scrap for it. When we picked this kid up, he had scratches all over his face and bruises. Because, I mean, if you wanted something, you were going to scrap for it. So if my son has hit your child, that's what he was working his way out of. Like, think about how hard it is for a kid to share in a typical setting here. Turn that up to 10. That's what he was coming out of. But you know, out of the, in the last four years, he, he, he would start to, like, if he had Cheerios, he'd start sharing it with Steph. And if he has toys, he'll start, you know, giving it to you. And he's nonverbal. So sometimes it's confusing, especially if you don't know what he's trying to communicate. And, and now when he wants to give you something, he'll say, for me? And if you don't say for me back, He'll say it again, for me, and then he gets louder and higher pitched and shrill. And if you don't know what he's trying to do, it's confusing his mess. Just a couple weeks ago, he was doing that to Pastor Fred with a flashlight. He's like, for me, and you don't, sometimes you don't realize at first, the reason he's doing this is because when he would share with Steph, she'd always say, for me, thank you, right? He, he learned that giving to somebody was going to produce joy in them. This, this idea, for me, thank you. So now, for me, for him, that's not saying, hey, this is actually for me. No, he's saying, I want to give this to you because he's learned that the joy of giving, the joy of generosity, he wants you to take that so he can see the joy in your face when you say, for me? And that's monumental for him. And see, I share this because when you're a baby or you're young, you expect to receive. You expect to be fed. But when you mature... (laughs) You learn to give and feed others. And it should be the same as believers. To grow in God's grace should mean that we grow in generosity. If your focus is still me and mine, if your, your, your first concern as a Christian is what about my needs? Your number one need is to grow up, to look more like Christ, who as it says in Philippians 2, he didn't even consider equality with God as something to cling to. But he humbled himself. He lived as man, obedient and open-handed until those open hands were pierced on the cross for you and for me. He gave his very life. How can we not give? Again, I want to read 2 Corinthians 6, but addressed to us, dear, dear city life. I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives, live openly and expansively. 
You know, we're going to go into a moment of worship, and I pray that even as we worship, and we're going to come back into a moment of prayer, that, that the Holy Spirit will put his finger on, on places where we're clinging. Maybe it's material things. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's our time and our talents. Maybe it's our privilege. I don't know what it might be for you, but can we open our hands? Matter of fact, can we stand and open our hands and raise them up to God as we worship? Just as, as a posture of saying to God, God, I want to open my hands to you. Show me where I'm clinging. Show me where I'm, 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 I'm concerned with me and mine and help me to live a posture of Abraham, willing to lay whatever down to follow you. Willing to step into moments of compassion, no matter the personal cost. Living open-handed, reaching out in generous lives. We prayed in Jesus' name. Let's worship. So, Father, here we are. Thanks again for joining us for Church Online. If you need prayer or have a question about the church, a question about what you just heard, or how to grow in your faith, our hosts are here for you. If you're on our Church Online platform, you can also click prayer or the contact button at the top of your screen. We'd love to follow up with you. But in the meantime, we hope you'll make plans to join us again next weekend right here at citylifeva.com slash live stream. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we Let's sing together. Yes, the world, yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. Come on, let's start our rehearsal now. So let's start right now. Why would we? your one desire just want to be with you we raise our voices and we say king of glory fill this place we just want to be with you we say we just want to be with you we will sing hallelujah until you We'll be praising you forever. How will we do it? Yes, we'll dance in your presence until you come again. Let's raise it. We will sing hallelujah. We will sing hallelujah. Come on, sing that song of praise. Sing that song of adoration to him. Yes, we'll dance in your presence until you come Raise that song of surrender and hallelujah. Yes, yes we'll dance in your presence till you come, till you come again. We won't wait till we get to heaven, but we'll sing, we'll sing hallelujah until you come again. Yes, we'll dance. Yes, we'll dance in your presence till you come, till you come again. And we call you the King. Just want to be with you. We raise our voices. We just want to be with 
just want to be We lay down our agendas and we call you King of the glory Fill this place We just want to be Sing it one more time We just want to be We just want to be You know, in the, the prayer in the Our Father, the, the peace of it, where it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, that's, that's within the Sermon on the Mount. You, know, you brag on Letter in a Birmingham Jail. The Sermon on the Mount is the greatest sermon ever preached. And, and, and going into the Our Father, Jesus is coming out of, of three statements about three spiritual disciplines where he says, when you fill in the blank, and then he, he advises us on how to do it. One of them is when you give, which we just talked about at length. The second is when you fast. And I just want to remind you as Vanessa that we're in a season of a church. When you talk about uh, uh, coming together as a body, as one, we're doing that fasting this month for the next two weeks leading up to our anniversary service. And as she said, it might look different for each person in here. The what, the how long. I just want to encourage you, let's press in together because God has something for us as individuals and as a church this year. And some of it, I believe we're going to tap into only if we press. <laughs> and one of the ways we're doing that is fasting. But so, so when you give, when you fast, and then the third is when you pray. And that's where he teaches his disciples how to pray. But we want to close this service with a focus on prayer as we've been doing for the past couple months. We just want to continue in that. And there's going to be a time for prayer. Online, it's going to stay open. You can click on that prayer button and our host will pray for you. And if you're here, you need prayer for anything. It might have nothing to do with the sermon tonight. You need prayer for anything. There are people here that want to pray with you. The band's going to keep playing. We're just, we just ask that we would keep this sanctuary in the atmosphere of prayer and worship. But dear Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you that you came and you gave. You were so generous, God, that you gave your son. Jesus, that you gave your life. God, I pray that as we follow you and draw near to you in moments like this, we would have <laughs> growth in that area of just living generously, open-handed, and reaching out. Renew our minds so we can renew our world in Jesus' name.